In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, this came about as something I was thinking about, and, and I came across it. I was reading through a book recently, and I found something really interesting. For those of you who have spent any time listening to me or, or know me personally, you know that one thing that I am really into is I really like words. I like understanding them. I like understanding the culture behind them, their history, their connotations, their denotations, all of that. I, I'm, I've always been fascinated by language and words, which is ironic because English is the only one that I kind of speak, and I'm not good at learning any others, and I can barely speak English as it is, but I appreciate y'all bearing with me despite that. When it comes to this one particular word that I, I heard the origin about the first time the other night, excruciating. Well, it turns out that the origin of excruciating is from the Latin. And it comes from two words, ex meaning out, and crux meaning cross. Now, I found that really interesting because what that means is that the excruciating pain, when we talk about something being excruciating, what we are literally saying is it is pain that is out of the cross. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. The Romans, because it is a word of Latin origin, the Romans could not come up with a way to describe the worst pain that a person can go through other than using the description of a crucifixion. That they felt there was not a single word in their vernacular, in their entire language, that adequately described the kind of pain that a person goes through by going to the cross to be crucified. So they had to literally invent a new word to describe it. That's astounding to me. And when we think about it, it means, first of all, it feels like we abuse that word quite a bit because we'll say excruciating. Oh, I stubbed my toe the other day. It was excruciating, or I stepped on a Lego yesterday. It was excruciating pain. Now, okay, stepping on a Lego, that really hurts. I've done that before. It's, it's quite painful. It's not like getting crucified. And that's, in the literal way, what we're saying. That, that's what we are trying to convey when we talk about an excruciating pain. I really want us to think about that because it makes sense. Doesn't it? When you think about it, it absolutely follows and makes sense because this was a way for the Romans, the single most powerful empire on earth, to torture their enemies to death. And they were experts at pain. Romans were really, really good at that. You know, the Romans were good at a few things. Building roads would be one of them. They were excellent at building roads. They had a really advanced plumbing system. And they were known throughout the world as experts when it came to torture. And crucifixion is the pinnacle of that. Because in a very realistic way, it combines several different types of torture all into one. Think about this. There were aspects of exhaustion. Because the way that a person was crucified, they would be hung on a cross and they would have to lift up their bodies just to breathe because while in the downward position while being crucified, you could inhale, but you could not exhale. And so in order to exhale and to be able to take in another breath just to be able to survive, you would have to push your body up against the cross and be able to inhale again and then slump back down only to repeat that process any time you wanted to take a breath. And so, eventually, what happened is your body became so fatigued and exhausted that you died. And this is how they prolonged the death process, because beheading or hanging or some other form of death that was relatively quick, they felt that that wasn't good enough for people that were being crucified, and so they wanted to prolong that agonizing experience as much as they possibly could. And then you look at, there were also aspects of exposure. 
you know, if you're sitting up there and there's going to be sun beating down on your head or cold winds going past you, depending on what time of year and what place you were being crucified in, there was an element of exposure slowly killing you as well. You were completely exposed to the elements, and you were also completely exposed to things like birds and bugs. Many times before a victim died on the cross, they would have these animals, you know, ravens or some other kind of devourer of the dead, as it were, come up to these bodies and, and land on them and try to eat on them, and you can't do anything about it because your limbs are immobilized. You can't swat away a fly or a bird or something like that. You're, you're powerless to do so. And then there's also the aspect of the cross itself and having to push yourself up onto that you had to be bound to it in a certain way. Now, this is what gets interesting because our Savior's crucifixion was even more cruel than the average one. Because in this particular case, he wasn't just bound to the cross with ropes, as was the more common practice. He was nailed to it, which was not unheard of. It did happen in ancient Rome, but it was not the more common form of this. And what would happen when you were nailed to the cross Typically, we see a depiction of a nail print in the palm of Jesus' hand. But that's simply not accurate. You see, in the Greek vernacular, when they said that something was driven into the hand, they were talking about everything from the elbow up. And so, the Bible is accurate in saying, because it's using the same word there for hand, but it actually would have taken place about right here, roughly an inch from the palm. And what that did was that fixated that nail between the radius and the ulna so that the person would not fall off of the cross. It was a much sturdier place to drive a nail into. But that made it even more painful because that would actually mean that it would penetrate the largest nerve in the arm. It would have been incredibly painful for that to take place. In fact, it would feel like the way that a doctor described it. Someone had taken the nerve that you hit when you bang your elbow on a table and you feel that shooting pain going up all through your arm. It would have felt like somebody taking that nerve and twisting it with a pair of pliers. As painful as that is to imagine, imagine that it's actually worse because it's a larger nerve that can feel more pain, and imagine that it is prolonged for six hours. Okay, as painful as that is, now imagine that you have to wrench your hand against it in order to get leverage to pull your body up just to take a breath. And you had to do this hundreds of times before you finally died. Are you starting to understand the level of suffering a person that was crucified had to go through? And by the way, Often we see a cross depicted as two parts, but it was actually three. There was a third part of a cross that would be nailed up to the, the vertical portion of it. And we're not sure if that was something that went underneath the buttocks or it was used to nail a person's feet to the cross, but either way it was designed to do the same thing, which is give a person leverage so that they could push themselves up more often. Now, originally... You might be thinking, well, this seems like an act of mercy, but it certainly was not. It only meant that it would prolong your suffering for an even longer period of time. That it would allow you to push yourself up longer, which would mean that you suffered even more. And the way that this would take place, we have to also consider that even though this wasn't common practice amongst most crucifixion victims, that Jesus was also wearing a crown of thorns that was thrust down onto his brow. And if you've ever been cut anywhere above the eye on the forehead or anything like that, you will know that any cut above the eye, because the blood is very close to the surface there, and because you have a layer between your skin and your skull of, of blood vessels, they bleed profusely. And so Jesus probably had sweat and blood running into his eyes this entire time. Now, I could go on and on for an entire sermon on the different methods that Jesus suffered on the cross, but I want you to take those in and think about just those aspects of it for a moment. That doesn't even come close to comparing with the spiritual and psychological turmoil he was going through. 
oftentimes victims of crucifixion, would be stripped completely naked. And so there was an aspect of both physical and sexual humiliation that was going on that we don't even talk about most of the time. That there would be people mocking him, gawking at him. And we see a little bit of this from the gospel account with the Jewish people and the elders mocking him to come down. We also see that there would have been a great deal of psychological trauma to Christ. He's been betrayed not only by one of his closest friends, Judas, but also by the people that were supposed to receive him and love him. The Jewish people that were supposed to be waiting for and looking for the Messiah were now the ones responsible for putting him through this torture. And then, of course, there's the greatest spiritual turmoil that he went through, abandonment by his father. And we know that he felt this because he cried out to God for forsaking him. That's what it felt like to him in that moment. There's no telling the, the depths of pain and agony that he went through. And ultimately, the reason that I convey all this to you is because I want you to understand that that was the price for our sin. That is the level of love that Christ had for us, that he was willing to endure all of that just so that we could have a chance at having fellowship with both him and his father one day. That we could have a redemption of our sin through his suffering. You see, it is incredibly ironic that crucifixion, the pinnacle, the culmination of all of the brutality that human beings could come up with, it is through that that came our salvation. You see, Jesus took on the full force, the bluntness of man's cruelty in a very realistic way when he went through crucifixion. The way that Rome said, if you defy us, this is what happens to you, because that's the only people that were crucified in the Roman Empire, specifically ones that defied Rome. And so, in a method of death that was intended to be as brutal as humanly possible, and that's specifically what the Romans were going for, through the ultimate act of human evil came the ultimate act of God's good, the ultimate act of his love and mercy for us. It is through the greatest evil that has ever taken place a brutal murder of an innocent person, a truly innocent person that has never done anything wrong in his entire life. That the greatest good, the salvation of mankind, came about. It's amazing to me that the ultimate act of man's evil is what bore the ultimate act of God's love. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.